Hey everyone, and welcome to The Real Colors of Health, where we discuss all things health. I'm Carrie, and today we're going to be discussing the FDA and their delay in approving an Alzheimer's drug called Donanamab. 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 So just let me preface this really quickly because... I am, I'm against a lot, I'm against these drugs that the FDA has approved thus far for Alzheimer's. And the reason I have been is just because of the science behind it. None of them have really proven to be effective to the disease Alzheimer's. And more importantly, other ways of attacking the illness have been way more effective and I have yet to hear any of the places who promote these drugs, promoting these alternative ways of healing the body. That said, one of the things that I want to do my best in with Real Colors of Health is just presenting information as I read it or as I come across it. I am not attempting to put my opinion on everything. It's gonna come out because it's my show and, you know, it's just going to naturally ooze out, but I do want to, I do want to do my best in just presenting the information and through my research on brain health, more specifically Alzheimer's and understanding how a lot of the people who say that Alzheimer's is reversible and preventable, they have kind of walked me through understanding how and why a lot of these drugs have never been effective. This is information that anybody can gain access to. And then it kind of sent me down a rabbit hole where I began to research some of the pharmaceutical companies who were working on drugs for Alzheimer's and either stopped they walked away from the research or it didn't get approved or it got approved, but then it wasn't effective. So I'm, I'm specific, I'm particularly interested in this topic when it comes up. And so when I got an email notification stating that the FDA, FDA was delaying the approval, I became curious as to why. So I'm going to pull up this article and read the article to you guys and we'll dive into why they um, are delaying this approval. So here we go. Okay, FDA delays action on closely watched Alzheimer's drug. Eli Lilly's Donanamab was expected to be approved this month, but the agency has decided to convene a panel of independent experts to evaluate the drug's safety and efficacy. <clears throat> Paula, I'm sorry, Pam Bellock is the author of this article. She's been reporting on Alzheimer's and other dementia for over a dozen years. And she says the Food and Drug Administration has decided to delay action on a closely watched Alzheimer's drug, Donanamab, which the agency was widely expected to approve this month. The FDA will instead require donanamab to undergo sorry let me take that off to undergo the scrutiny of a panel of independent experts the drug makers the drugs maker eli and company said friday the fda has informed lily it wants to further understand topics related to evaluating the safety and efficacy of donanamab including the safety results in donanamab treated patients in the efficacy implications of the unique trial design, the company said in a statement. The decision is likely to surprise many Alzheimer's experts, doctors, and patients who had expected the medication would soon be on the market. The FDA's move was startling to the company, which had been planning for the agency to green light the drug during the first quarter of this year. It's kind of interesting how the company can plan for the agency to give the green light before it gives the green light. That's kind of interesting, like the level of confidence, but I'm guessing that that's, you know, due to their own research or what have you. 
<clears throat> we were not expecting this Ann White, an executive vice president of Lilly and president of its neuroscience division, said in an interview. She said that while the FDA often calls on such independent advisory committees when it has questions about drugs, it was unusual to do so at the end of the review cycle and beyond the action date that the FDA had given us. So I guess that's what happened. They went through the whole process and it wasn't until the end that they decided to make this call. The FDA did not say anything publicly about the move, which will delay any decision about whether to approve Donanumab until at least later this year. Lilly officials said they expected it would be a few months before the advisory committee holds a hearing. The FDA did uh, commit to us to move quickly, so we would hope that they would then take action shortly after the advisory committee, Mrs. White said. The decision to convene an advisory committee reflects the high stakes and rocky history of developing treatments for Alzheimer's. I'm going to read that again. The decision to convene an advisory committee reflects the high stakes and rocky history of developing treatments for Alzheimer's. Because that was something that I definitely read is that a lot of money has been spent on trying to find a drug for Alzheimer's. <clears throat> a lot of companies have failed. The disease afflicts more than 6 million Americans and currently has no cure and medication that can restore memory loss or reverse cognitive decline. For years, the field was marked by failed drug trials, but donanumab, an infusion given once a month, belongs to a new class of drugs that experts hope might help patients by attacking a protein amyloid that clumps into plaque in the brains of people with Alzheimer's. Last year, the FDA approved another drug in the class, Laquimbi, made by Isay and Biogen. An infusion given every two weeks, Laquimbi can modestly slow cognitive decline in the early stages of Alzheimer's. The new drugs are considered only a first step in a potentially fruitful direction because they may not slow decline enough to be noticeable to patients or families, experts say. The drugs also carry significant safety risks, including swelling and bleeding in the brain. The first drug approved in the anti-amyloid class, Adulham, uh, was controversial because it, was, it had weak evidence. Biogen, the manufacturer of the drug, recently abandoned it. We'll, we'll look at that um, another time. Donanumab was expected to win approval easily because data showed that the drug could also modestly slow cognitive decline in people with mild symptoms and the safety risks were similar to those of Laquimbi. Because Donanumab's trial design was different than Laquimbi's and included some patients with more complex medical problems, the two, drug tri the two drugs trials cannot be directly compared. Donanumab's trial had two unusual aspects that the FDA indicated it would ask the advisory committee to evaluate, said Dr. John Sims, a medical director with Lilly and the leader of the Donanumab clinical trials. One feature would be particularly appealing to patients. Participants in the trial stopped receiving donanumab after their amyloid plaques were cleared to a certain level, about a year for half the participants who started off with donanumab, and their cognitive decline kept slowing. Lilly scientists have estimated it would take nearly four years for amyloid levels to bump up over the threshold again. Dr. Sims said he believed the FDA wanted to understand more about stopping treatment because it's very unique and regulators might want to explore whether other anti-amyloid drugs could be halted at a certain point. Mrs. Smith said that among doctors and patients, there's a lot of enthusiasm for this concept of once you clear the target that you're going after, that you don't need to put patients through additional infusions and visits. The other unusual feature of the trial involved another protein, tau, which forms tangles in the brain after amyloid accumulates. Higher tau levels are more closely associated with memory and thinking problems. 
The Denanumab trial divided participants into groups with high tau levels and intermediate tau levels. People with intermediate tau levels had more slowing of cognitive decline, supporting a widespread theory that treating patients as early as possible in the disease process provides a better chance of slowing symptoms. Dr. Sims said that measuring tau was informative, but not necessary for instant instituting therapy for patients and we had treatment if we had treatment effects across the entire spectrum of tau he said that the fda had not indicated the specifics of what they want to talk about involving tau just that it was a subject the advisory committee would consider mrs white said there are some people here at lily that have been working on this for 35 years and so you can imagine that this was certainly a disappointment to them not to bring this to patients right now. But she said the company was confident in its data and would spend the next few months thinking about additional analysis that we can do to help answer any questions that someone might pose at us. Um, so I just thought that this was very interesting and I am definitely going to follow this story because I'm curious of what they um what they halted for I, I'm curious of what the explanation is but I also noticed that there were some comments over here where are the comments I wanted to read a couple of the comments I'm glad to see FDA is looking further into this drug but you have to question why drugs like these which have a very minimal effect if any, and have such serious side effects are allowed to go this far in production. And in the Alzheimer's research community, there is significant questioning whether the approach of reducing amyloid plaque is the right direction to be taking as the results have been, haven't been promising, even as most of the research funding has been focused on this approach. That was the first thing that I learned about when I read Dr. Dale Bredesen's book, The End of Alzheimer's, because in that book, he explains how the whole the whole concept behind finding a cure, if you will, for Alzheimer's disease has been based off of the the theory from let me ask. Hold on. Let me ask Enrique real quick. Who came up with. um Hey, Enrique, who is the doctor or scientist who came up with the theory of what causes Alzheimer's disease? I can't remember his name. Al Alois Alzheimer. Okay, so he was a psychiatrist and neuropathologist. He observed abnormal clumps, now known as amyloid plaque, and tangled bundles of fibers, um, now called neurofibrillary tangles, or I think that that would be the tau, in the brain of a patient who had died of an unusual mental illness. These plaques and tangles are considered hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. However, the exact cause of Alzheimer's disease is still not fully understood and is believed to be the result of a combination of genetic, environmental, and lifestyle factors. Now, um, I've been talking to my chat GPT quite a bit about what I have learned about Alzheimer's. So I think that might be a little bit why he's saying what he's saying at the end. Nonetheless, one of the things that Dr. Bredesen discussed in the book was that so much of the, you know, like the proposed cures or not proposed cures, but the attempts at curing and the medications and all of that stuff, a lot of it was based off of um, Dr. Alzheimer's theory of what caused Alzheimer's, which was this amyloid plaque buildup, because a lot of the people who came who were attempting to come up with these um, drugs for Alzheimer's, they were attacking the problem of the amyloid plaque buildup because that was the the concept that got out to the masses. And 
what has been discovered with research, a lot of which was published, but didn't get the the level of attention that it needed because at this point people people had already bought into the idea that what caused Alzheimer's was this bit the brain kind of acting crazy and producing this amyloid plaque buildup. What they found was that one, there were quite a few people who had passed away who did not show signs of Alzheimer's who had the amyloid plaque buildup. So that one sh- showed that that doesn't necessarily mean you'll have Alzheimer's if you have the amyloid plaque, but two, that the brain actually was not malfunctioning by producing this amyloid plaque, but was in fact operating the way that it should be. It was actually responding to what was happening in the body and the plaque the the production of the plaque was actually a defense mechanism, if you will. It was the body's way, the brain's way of protecting itself, which led to those in the medical field who did, who wanted to look at alternative ways of attacking Alzheimer's. I think this caused a lot of them to direct their research in other spots like Well, if the brain is functioning how it's supposed to, then clearly the amyloid plaque, the tau, is a symptom of something. It's the result of something. What's making the brain go into this helter-skelter kind of a protective mode or this, this mode of producing all of this plaque? Oh, It's not a silver bullet approach, as Dr. Bredesen would say. It's a silver buckshot approach. We have to look at multiple things that are happening here. So as this woman over, as this uh, Rebecca is saying over here, that there is significant questioning whether the approach of reducing amyloid plaque is the right direction to be taking. That's why, because what has been happening is that all of these pharmaceutical companies have been basing their research and basing their, you know, their drugs on reducing this amyloid plaque. Now, they're saying in this article that they're taking a bit of a different approach, but it still sounds to me like they are targeting the brain as the final stop. They are targeting what's happening in the brain as the only area to be looked at. I could be wrong. Maybe once we learn more about the drug in their, their research and what they did in the trials, you know, it'll show something otherwise. But let's say that the amyloid plaque was an issue because it is true that a lot of people who have Alzheimer's do have this plaque. Let's just assume that that reducing the plaque could help. Let's just assume that a drug being able to reduce the plaque could help even still that would not be solving the overall issue of what's happening in someone's body to cause them to have Alzheimer's and I like the way that Dr. Bredesen describes it he describes it kind of like a roof with I think he says like 36 holes in it because his protocol covers 36 uh, targets I believe and he said it's imagine if you have a leaky roof with 36 holes when we talk about a drug we're even if the drug was effective we're talking about plugging up one hole because again the drug is only dealing with one of the symptoms of this disease so it's going to be real real difficult I think for us to ever hear that there is this miracle drug because it's not a miracle approach it's not a one hole approach it's it's at least 36 holes or you know maybe all 36 might not be a hole for you but it's going to be a combination of different things that you have to target so what this woman is saying I totally agree with her what Rebecca is saying a WTJ says watch my grandfather aunt and my mom all pass from Alzheimer's and all were given a supposed miracle drug that at least once one I'm sorry that at least one each of their specialists eventually insinuated did nothing. Same thing here with my mom. The The medication that my mom has been on, there's been no 
no real sign of improvement. If anything, they've increased or decreased the dosage. That I think they decreased her dosage before because it was making her lose her appetite. I applaud the FDA. Make sure the drug company isn't just paying for well oil promotion. Don't give anyone else in our family false hope is more painful than healthy resignation. KM say you would think an independent panel of experts would review any drug presented for approval. The FDA is certainly not that. I'm thinking it's a bribery stunt to try to force Eli Lilly to increase the bribe amount. Allen said, not a surprise that they are being extra cautious. They already approved a drug that was outrageously overpriced and doesn't work particularly well and were rightfully criticized for the approval. Thomas says, if only they took this approach. I'm not saying that. Um, Dr. J says, right now, it seems that our best bet is to try to prevent dementia and lifestyle matters. And the most important part of lifestyle is... And the most important part of lifestyle is diet. Eat mostly to all whole plant foods while avoiding processed foods, especially highly processed foods and animal products. Exercise moderately, avoid tobacco and alcohol and get enough sleep. Keep mentally active. Research indicates that up to about 40% of dementia could be prevented by adopting these healthy lifestyle habits. And there are no adverse effects to this approach, only health benefits, including reducing the risk of and slowing, stopping, and possibly reversing other lifestyle conditions such as cardiovascular disease, T2, type 2 diabetes, and high blood pressure. Somebody said, yes, hopefully more people will be open to changing what they eat. I've been whole oh, WFPB for about three years and no complaints. Whole, I don't know, whole food plant, a whole foods plant based. My cholesterol numbers are down. I didn't have blood pressure issues. OK, he quotes Mrs. White and said there's a lot of enthusiasm for this con concept of once you clear the target that you're going after that you don't need to put patients through additional infusions and visits. The so-called target here is amyloid. For decades now, it has been well known to researchers that cleared amyloid is not a solution, not even a partial solution to advancing dementia. But sure, among doctors and patients, there might well be a lot of enthusiasm for this concept. And this enthusiasm benefits Eli Lilly. However, targeting tau is indeed promising. I keep hoping for a drug that really works. Ever growing evidence says that removing amyloid prevents Alzheimer's about as well as stopping a cough cures a cold. That's it. It doesn't. The presence of amyloid is not entirely understood. The race to optimize its removal is based on a biologically plausible theory that the amyloid plaque causes the symptom in all symptoms in Alzheimer's patients. However, that theory looks less and less likely. Yeah. The data does not justify approval. At this time, prevention seems our best bet. Are there any lifestyle behaviors we can engage in to prevent or at least delay cognitive decline? A 2017 study published in Neurology from Rush University involving 960 people who did not have dementia and averaged 81 years at the start of the study were tested for thinking and memory skills multiple times over the course of the study. Over 10 years of follow-up, older adults who ate at least one serving of leafy green vegetables a day showed the equivalent of being 11 years younger cognitively compared to those who rarely or never consume leafy green vegetables. These results held even when controlling for other factors that could influence cognitive health, such as seafood consumption, alcohol, smoking, high blood pressure, obesity, education level, exercise, and involvement in intellectually engaging activity. The study results do not prove that daily leaf, leafy green consumption slows brain aging, but do suggest an intriguing association. Cautious progress. So I will say that I am happy to see 
these types of comments because it lets me know that other people are out here aware of more information than what is fed to us through the FDA or through even perhaps our doctor's offices or what have you. But again, we'll keep up with this story. So I'm not going to read through all these comments. It was 70 something comments here, but I will be sure to keep a watch out for, for the drug and keep an eye out for what the FDA says was their issues with it. And if they even are able to rectify that, I am going to put up my next video I think I'm going to do weekly videos for the real color of health to start so that I don't overwhelm myself <laughs> and I'm consistent. So I have tons of topics that I want to talk to you guys about. This one just came out of nowhere in my email. So I was like, let me get started. Like this will just be the first one. This is no indication of the direction that I'm going in with topics or anything like that. Obviously, I will be doing a lot of conversation on brain health because that's just one of my like priorities here. But I just use this as an opportunity to get started with my channel. So I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm working on how Ecamm works. So it might look a little bit choppy with my movement with my screen, but hopefully you guys are able to appreciate my effort <laughs> charge my head and not my heart <laughs> so thank you for uh for sticking it out with me for this episode and you know let me know what your thoughts are about the fda's pausing of this approval you know how, are you how close is Alzheimer's disease to you? Is it a disease that luckily you've never had to deal with? You know, do you know someone with it? What are your thoughts surrounding it? What What are you interested in learning or knowing about it? That would help me tremendously because then I can be sure to cover that in my research. Because again, this the point of this channel is not for me to be this health expert because I'm not. I'm on a health journey and always looking to learn how to improve my health and my family's health and to understand my body better. So my hope is to help to put light in areas that maybe are dark for you or to open up conversations in spaces that you didn't think of or maybe that you did but didn't really have a place to go to. So please always feel free to share your questions, your insights, your resources here with us. And until next time, I pray that you have a wonderful and incredible day, night, evening, morning, whenever you see this video. And please be sure to put your health first because you are worth it. Thanks guys and have a great one. Bye.